Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our plenary session today, Futures of Gender and Sexuality Studies, um, which, which brings back a few of our grad certificate, earn, uh, ah, grad certificate earners from GSWS over the years. Um, David Ng is going to be moderating this, but first I'll go ahead and introduce him at great length. Mm. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's going to read from my dissertation. I'm, I'm going to, uh, and, and his undergrad thesis. Um, so David Ng is Richard L. Fisher Professor of English and Professor in the Program of Asian American Studies, of which he is also Faculty Director. Um, and he is also Core Faculty in Complet and GSWS here at Penn. He's the author of several books, most recently, Racial Melancholia, Racial Soci Dissociation on the Social and Psychic Lives of Asian Americans. And he's the co-editor of numerous collections, including the recent issue of Social Text, Left of Queer, and the field-changing 2005 essay, uh, issue of Social Text, What's Queer About Queer Studies Now? Um, in 2001, David was awarded the Kessler Prize from the Center for LGBTQ Studies, which is given to a scholar or activist who has produced a body of work that has, has, has had a significant influence on the field of LGBTQ studies. And he has just turned in his most recent book, Reparations and the Human, so look out for that coming out with Duke um, in, in short order, hopefully. Um, I'll now hand things over to David. Thanks so much, Melissa. So I am so thrilled to be here and to see all your beautiful faces this morning. I, Benji and I were just talking about how it's so elevated. We have chocolate croissants this morning. <laughs> so I'm just thrilled. I never knew that you could bring food into this room. So, you know, GSWS is very special. And so is our panel, uh, Future of Gender and Sexuality Studies. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel, which consists entirely of both GSWS certificate holders and PhDs from the Department of English. Um, so I am delighted to introduce our three speakers. And we decided that we would go in order of youth uh, to age. Um, so we are going to, not in terms of graduation, not age, age. So <laughs> we are going to start with uh, Ava L.J. Kim, all the way to my left, who graduated from the department in 2022. Ava is an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at the University of California, Davis. She previously held the 2022-23 Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Trans Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Ava completed her PhD at, at Penn and her BA in creative writing at McAllister College, and her work has appeared or is forthcoming in American Studies, TSQ, GLQ, Radical History Review, as well as the edited collection About Face, Stonewall Revolt, and the New Queer Art, which was edited by our dear colleague and former director Jonathan Katz, sitting right there next to Seychelle. Um that's a lot of publications for a first year. I, I've been assistant busy. professor. You've been busy, yeah. Ava. They Ava's been like busy. This year, though. <laughs> like this year. Yay. Uh, next in the middle is Mary Zaborskis, who graduated from the department in 2017. She's an assistant professor of American Studies and Gender Studies at Penn State Harrisburg. Her monograph, Queer Childhoods, which just came out. And, you know, Folks, this is like so old school. It's over 300 pages. <laughs> Thank you, NYU. <laughs> hey, it's like two books. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll talk about yeah. it. We should just cut it in half. Like, Mary has two monographs. I know. Okay, so um, Mary's monograph, Queer Childhoods, Institutional Futures of Indigeneity, Race, and Disability, just came out from NYU Press. It explores how children's sexualities were managed in the 19th and 20th century boarding schools of marginalized children. Her work has appeared and is forthcoming in GLQ, Signs, Feminist Formations, WSQ, and Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. She's the series editor 
at Public Books and serves on the steering committee of the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania's History Project. And last but not least is Benji Kahan, who is next to me, who graduated from the department in 08. Uh, Benji is the Herbert Huey McElveen Professor, that's so fancy, of English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Louisiana State University. He has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Reed Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the University of Sydney, the University of Pittsburgh, Emory University, and Washington University in St. Louis. Benji is the author of many books, including Celibacies, American Modernism, and Sexual Life. That came out in 2013 from Duke. And the book of Minor Perverts. Um, you, are you going to write a book about major perverts? <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Okay. Maybe today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the book of Minor Perverts, Sexology, Etiology, and the Emergence of Sexuality, which came out in 2019 from Chicago, and his new monograph, Sexual Aim and Its Misses, is under contract with Chicago as well. So please join me in welcoming our fabulous panelists, and we will start with Ava. Should I go, should I go up there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. all right. I wasn't sure with the mic. <laughs> it's tempting, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so good to be back and to see so many familiar faces. Um, yeah, I received so much guidance and mentorship here and through gender studies and English. And, and yeah, I'm just really grateful that I can come back and show some of my work. Um, oh, we're already on. Oh, oh I... here it is. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and to show, um, just thank you, um, how my work has been shaped by the department here um, and how it's shifted a bit. So, yeah, um, I think, yeah, I'll just get started. Um, when Professor Sanchez reached out, she asked us to talk a bit about situating our work in the broader field of gender and sexuality studies. Um, so for today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I see trans studies as a field adapting in real time to the massive simultaneous increase in both trans visibility and fascist violence worldwide. Um, to do so, I wanted to home in on three scenes or theoretical engagements with trans notions of the human at a transnational scale while situating some of my work in those genealogies. This is by no means exhaustive, it's just three small engagements, but um, much of my thinking for today comes out of a teaching project I worked on mm -hmm. with my colleagues at the University of Illinois last year, what we called a Trans Studies for Bullshit Times syllabus. In it, we tried to respond to some of the most common anti-trans rhetoric circulating in public discourse today. Drag bans, bathroom bans, healthcare bans, and the list goes on. Over five, I know many people in this room know this already, but as a reminder, over 500 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced in state legislatures across the US, nearly three times the number of such bills in 2022. And in January of 2024, anti-trans legislators have introduced an additional 175 bills aimed at eliminating trans presence in virtually all spheres of public life. Every year that I talk about this work, the number of anti-trans bills increases. We are scrambling to meet these attacks in court and find ways to disrupt business as usual. Many activist groups, especially in states like Florida and Texas, are taking actions that closely echo demonstrations by famous AIDS activist groups like ACT UP, as well as the ongoing protests against genocide in Gaza. We are fighting and pleading for our own and others' humanity, often to those who seem to have none. In putting together some of our arguments and histories, legitimizing trans life, I and my colleagues found ourselves in a position of terrible ambivalence. 
On the one hand, we feel a need to respond to the lies driving anti-trans discourse. Scholars like Sawyer Kemp, C. Riley Snorton, Xavier Nunn, Igor de Souza, and Jules, Jules Gil Peterson all rebuke the notion that trans is a new phenomenon, tracing histories of gender nonconformity over multiple centuries. And yet, we always hold onto the rejoinder, should it matter if we're new and do they really care? Similarly, we find ourselves legitimizing gender-affirming care through statements of support by the American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, World Health Organization, and many, many others, though we continue to point out the violence of these organizations' classifications. Benjamin Singer criticizes what he calls a top-down approach to trans medical knowledge, while Sean Saif Awal demonstrates that the history of intersex surgery reveals an unending insistence on pathologization and cure in gendered healthcare, itself steeped in eugenic and ableist histories of medical coercion. But trans health activists and scholars, like my colleague at Davis, Christoph Hansman, argue that medical data and discourse can be carefully manipulated to access material resources and work to hold police accountable in his case studies from Buenos Aires and New York City. Both of these examples point to a preponderance of ambivalence and fatigue, both within the field and in trans communities worldwide. We find ourselves arguing for the, the legality of our lives, but on mm -hmm. terms that are at best annoyingly limited and at worst actively detrimental to our long-term survival. Hill Malatino encouraged us to, quote, stay with this coterie of bad feelings like fatigue and numbness, while Cam Awkward Rich points us to what we disavow in our rejection of maladjustment, quote, forms of sickness and blackness that leave the racialized disabled body mired in fixity or rendered as spectral. As such, I've been trying to think recently with this ambivalence and a politics of simultaneity, that is, how do we respond to the immediate need to halt anti-trans violence and ignorance while also seeking to reset the terms of the debate in the first place? A few scenes come to mind. On, on February, 20, er, February 10th, 2023, trans activist Lindsay Sparrow joined a large group of trans people testifying before the Florida Board of Osteopathic Medicine, which had recently voted to bar anyone under the age of 18 from receiving trans surgeries or hor hormones. As in many other state hearings, the board heard from a long line of children, parents and doctors testifying on the importance of gender affirming care but Sparrow took a different approach. Addressing the board's members at a public e hearing, he said, quote, I could stand here and tell you about the times that I tried to end my life because I didn't have access to gender affirming care, but I know you don't care. I see you sneering at us while we come here and talk to you. Instead, I'm going to take the rest of my time to demonstrate the sacred and weekly ritual of my shot in front of you in this body my medication is life-saving. I will use HRT for the rest of my life. He then proceeded to inject his stomach to a silent audience. Trans flag trailing over his shoulders, the performance had a chilling effect. A vulnerable episode that for a brief period of time seemed to reject the health measures versus vague demonization debate. Scholar Toby Beecham writes on Sparrow that he steps outside the typical framing of healthcare for trans children as a question of parents' rights, pushing us toward a reinstatement of children's autonomy as disenfranchised subjects. Similarly, I wonder if Sparrow enables us to add something different to the legislative framework currently dominating discourse about trans life. Over and over, we find ourselves trying to appeal to a sense of empathy that doesn't exist. What kinds of performance of life and spirit might help us establish other terms of personhood in this era of incredible anti-trans violence? Even while we know we have to keep fighting in court and state assemblies. <clears throat> in his now famous essay, We Are All Non-Binary, Kaji Amin argues that non-binary identity is a distinctly Western and colonial construction predicated not on the rejection of binary gender, as is commonly described, but instead on what he names the, quote, autological sovereign individual. 
Amin calls on all of us who find ourselves somewhere within the nomenclature of trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming to tie non-binary to, quote, positive social content rather than something devoid of it as non-binary currently is. What concerns him the most is that the, quote, neoliberal universalization of identity as the basis of all politics has made it appear necessary to announce one gender's one's gender politics as an identity rather than simply enacting them. To do so, Amin draws a distinction between transition and identification, arguing that the former entails material and physical changes, while the latter only requires declaration and some form of psychic investment. Taking inspiration from Amin's critique, I'm interested in how non-binary might be understood as a distinctly Western construction and on both its spread and limitations transnationally. In looking to non-US understandings of trans life and politics, the distinction between material transition and declarational identification becomes less clear. In one of four case studies from my book, Still Life, Transgenre, and the Politics of Anti-Development, I analyze the ways in which the transnational export of a legal right to transition has transformed from access to hormones, surgeries, and cosmetic modifications into a right to disclose gender identity through legal documentation. That is, on a transnational stage, transition and identification have become inseparable. This is not a disagreement with Amin's intervention. Rather, I hope to make Amin's criticism even more expansive by trying to understand how transition transnationally became declaration and how declaration became disclosure. When meeting with Travesi organizers in Buenos Aires last year from the group Travesi Trans Las Históricas Argentinas, I was struck by what activists told me is an emerging generational difference between Travesti survivors of dictatorship and a younger generation that increasingly identifies as no binario or non-binary. Famed travesti theorist Marlena Valla told me that the needs of these generations felt radically different. Though non-binary activists had successfully secured um, uh, the passage of a bill enabling Argentine citizens to use an X as their gender marker as opposed to male or female, Bayer argued that she and other travestis were still advocating for reparations from their time under dictatorship, for jobs, for money, shelter, as they continued to struggle accessing basic resources for survival. But markers of trans progress for both generations of activists were never merely focused on legal identification. In passing the now famous gender identity law of 2012 in Argentina, a coalition of intersex, travesti, trans, and gay and lesbian organizers successfully passed a federal mandate for coverage of trans healthcare in both public and private plans. Phrased holistically under the moniker of a quote, right to gender identity, the bill became a benchmark of trans progress across the world. State leaders in Germany, Chile, Switzerland, Malta, all cite Argentina as a beacon of trans progress and the law itself as a model for other forms of state recognition. But the abstraction of the law by transnational LGBT organizations, like the Human Rights Campaign, has shifted a focus on the law's changes in healthcare to a debate on legal documentation. One of the travesti critiques of the law when it first passed was that it continued to strengthen our adherence to the male-female binary, but that complaint was converted by state officials as the need for an amorphous third category, the gender marker, X, on state documents. Just two days ago, newly elected Argentine president Javier Millet banned the use of inclusive language on all state correspondence, building on a recent wave of right wing on a recent wave of right wing rage about the use of gender inclusive language in schools, an America's wide debate about words like Latinx, Latine, and Latino. But again, the right to gender identity in 2012 signified something very different from its meaning now. In fact, 
It's mediation specifically through transnational bodies, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and government agencies shifted its connotations over the last 10 years into what is now read as a right to identification. But as Toby Beecham points out, the recognition of these gender markers never signifies mere recognition, but instead a demand for trans disclosure to state entities, along with a public demand for passing and integration. I argue then, in an extension of Amin's work, that the transnational collapse of the right to gender identity and the right to transition into identification and non-binary has enabled in part the right-wing fascist accusation that non-binary and trans have no material basis. The effect of this transformation is made even more conspicuous when moving beyond the Americas and the global north. In nations like Vietnam, one of my other case studies, the discourse of human rights has historically been used to abject the communist state, making the language of a right to transition especially strange. If the US, the United Nations, and human rights groups used Vietnam to signify the antithesis of human rights freedom for decades, how then should we understand the mediation of a trans rights discourse in places that supposedly have no history of humanity? In the map I show here and in several recent headlines, Vietnam is framed as a trans supportive nation in progress. Maps like this one from Equaldex, an LA-based LA crowdsourcing platform that was adopted as a measurement tool by the United Nations last year, argue that Vietnam's 2015 law legalizing sex reassignment surgery was a step in the right direction, but ultimately fell short of Argentina's gender identity law. Several LGBT organizations and media groups advanced this rhetoric by framing Vietnam's law through the now transnationally legible right to transition, again, which here only signifies legal name change, arguing that Vietnam had made significant progress but failed to remove surgery requirements. I want to defamiliarize this framing, which accomplishes a remarkable amount of work in a few short words and a couple of images. While it's true that Vietnam still requires surgery for an individual to change their legal gender, the question of trans progress in Vietnam cannot simply use the same criteria, already problematized in the case of Argentina. Though this is a much more complicated history than I have the time to explain here, what I want to emphasize is that the prominence of surgery as a central feature of gender transition in Vietnam is born not from a discourse of medical transition in stages, but instead the nation's doimoi, what trans what's translated in English as the renovation period when Vietnam transitioned from socialist partition to what I call a, Viet a capitalism with Vietnamese characteristics. As Arv Hansen, Hagen Ku, and Tu Hong Nguyen Vo have all demonstrated the transition to Vietnamese capitalism after the Civil War entailed a demand of its citizens to express some connection to a supposedly authentic socialist past. Nguyen Vo argues that this expression manifested primarily through a type of consumerism that connected expressions of national femininity to an authentic socialist past devoid of Western influence. Trans life and recognition was no stranger to this commodification process. In an exemplary demonstration of what Jasper Puar calls piecing the body, it comes as no surprise then that the consumption of surgery as an expression of national authenticity became tied to legislation. Like the Travesi activists I described earlier, many, many gender nonconforming subjects in Vietnam defy these national drives to consumption through a series of ambivalent expressions, something I analyzed in films like Lin Thi Tam's Madame Fong's Last Journey and Swan Dubu's and Fong Tao Tran's Finding Fong. But the primary reason I share this rereading of Vietnam's political and cultural discourse on trans life is because I want to track how the mediation of transition transnationally from medical change to identification to declaration all point to an overarching framework that traps us in the same discussion that Lindsay Sparrow so actively resisted. That is under the current exploitation of non-binary declaration transnationally transition becomes the vehicle for a certain legibility as human. Viewed in this way, the fascist fight against transition globally actually builds on the liberal dilution of a right to transition into non-binary declaration. Here, the right to change one's name without surgery becomes what Gayatri Spivak famously referred to as something one cannot not want. 
But as a field, we seem to be searching for other ways out. Not an outright refusal exactly, but an acknowledgement that we need other terms for trans life, both in the law, but also for ourselves. To close, I'd like to return to what I find so compelling about Lindsay Sparrow's act of resistance before Florida's Board of Medicine. It can be tempting at first to argue that Sparrow's performance of hormonal injection indicates an easy positive or material addition to what we stake out as transition and or non-binary. But again, we run into the same problem of medical violence and a long history of institutional imposition that got us here in the first place. Instead, when I abstract from Sparrow's striking performance as a step outside the discourse of humanity and human rights into something else. Perhaps then non-binary can operate as something other than declaration when tied to other genealogies. Here I turn to several scholars in Black trans studies who have unpacked the material legacy of gender that takes the rejection and denial of the human as its foundation. C. Wiley Snorton, Erica Hollis O'Neill, S.A. Smith, and Julian Kavon Glover have all in different ways traced gender as a racial form that rendered humanity by disarticulating Black and Indigenous bodies from gender and sexuality altogether. Snorton details this process in part by writing with Sylvia Winter that the colonial symbolic order shifted the primacy of a, quote, anatomical model of sexual difference to that of the physiognomic model of racial cultural difference taking the human not as static object, but as, quote, at once social, cultural, material, political, a storied work in progress, Snorton reworks the human as a genre in process. Winter's tracing of the human from the biocentric figure of man one to the capitalist figure of man two helpfully frames the ways that transition has come to signify both the racial components of passing and a new form of medical purchasing power. Taking this genealogy as a definitive understanding of not just the figure of the human, but also what we can even conceive of as possible forms of human change, I argue that gender transitions transformation into a vehicle for becoming legible as human finds its roots in this colonial process of genre formation. Snorton writes on the importance of articulating these new languages, oh whoops, Saying, how does one escape the self-evidence of the order of consciousness that is everywhere the property of each culture's sociogenic principle and of the mode of nature culture symbiosis to which each principle gives rise? Put differently, how does one access a language outside of and in contradistinction to the governing codes that currently determine human definition such that it gives, to new, gives rise to new meanings, forms of life, and genres of being? Returning to the generational divide between non-binary and travesti in Argentina, I find a racial haunting that prevents us from merely returning to a discourse of material medical intervention. While travestis have long described a shifting form of racialization over decades, surgical interventions against other populations, namely okay. intersex, literally disappeared from the gender identity law in its development stages. Such a disappearance, I argue, reiterates the Argentine state's own erasure of indigeneity and mestizo possibility within the nation, one recodified in its population as multiculturalism following the 2001 economic crisis. For this reason, a means call for a material transition beyond mere speech acts cannot fall into the same trap of a, quote, right to transition, even when understood as medical modification. Instead, in each context, we find a need for misalignment, for a symbolic order that articulates other genres. Sparrow's Act found a way to be disruptive by ignoring the terms set by the Florida Board of Medicine in the first place. This is not to suggest that hormones can be utilized in all rhetorical struggles, but this notion of trying to reset the conversation to purposefully misalign transition may offer us something else, more strategies as the wave of fascist violence grows ever stronger. Thank you. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, so that was amazing, Ava. I'm so excited to talk more. <laughs> um, so first, thank you so much to Melissa, Gwendolyn, Riley, um, and everyone involved in organizing this event. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be back here. Um, I think actually last time I was standing at this podium, I was roasting the English department during our annual collation event. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice to be re-inhabiting the space a little bit differently today. <laughs> um, I'm not doing that today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about my first book project and how it's framing some new things that I'm working on and then share some material toward that. Um, so in my first book project, um, also my only book, but uh, <laughs> I like the optimism built into first, uh, queer childhoods. Uh, in this, I'm really interested in the disciplining of gender and sexuality in 19th and 20th century boarding schools that were established for marginalized children. So I'm looking at Native American boarding schools, reform schools, schools for disabled children, and African American industrial schools. Now, in addition to trades and some semblance of uh, academic subjects, these institutions educated children as well in white, bourgeois, heterosexual norms that children would never be able to fully inhabit. I argue that these educations left children in a queer time. The ostensible assimilation, reform, and progress that these schools promised were actually designed to fail, but the attachment to impossible norms continued to shape children's bodies, sexual capacities, labor, and orientation to the state even after they left the schools. Norms, then, sustained children in a queer temporality. Queerness was a manufactured exclusion that was intended to leave children in the margins. <clears throat> This queerness is discernible only through a temporal approach because it looks sexually normative. Identity approaches to queerness and queer children do not capture the ways that these children's bodies, sexualities, and reproductive capacities were vehemently targeted and managed in schools in order to align with these unattainable white settler colonial bourgeois norms. This work reveals the violent intimacies that can exist among queerness, institutions, and processes of normalization. In these archives, institutions are not opposed to queerness, they produce queerness. Queerness looks like a proper gendered and sexual identity. Before and after photos that capture Native children in a properly domestic setting wearing settler clothing, uh, criminalized Black girls attending a picnic with the local boys' reform school, blind children attending a school dance, or Black children avowing Christian-inflected moral morals of family and industry. What appears as a gendered and sexual identity evidences the production of a temporality. So my first book's research on the ways that the state and its institutions determine which children get to enter the future and under what conditions animates the questions that I explore in my second book project in progress, Experimental Childhoods. So this project is exploring medical, psychological, and scientific archives to consider how experimenting on vulnerable children has been a state and institutionally sanctioned strategy to secure universal childhood as a white, able-bodied, bourgeois, heterosexual construction. Knowledge and value have been abstracted from targeted children's bodies, experiences, and subjectivities in order to bolster universalizing narratives of childhood, while these children themselves remain suspended in institutional time, locked in a state of arrested development, and or unable to access full economic, social, and political futures. Through examining cases across historical, geographical, and cultural contexts, a universal dynamic emerges. Time and time again, children marked as obstacles to civilization's progress by virtue of their race, class, ethnicity, gender, and or sexuality are disposable, but practitioners in the fields of science and medicine occlude these processes by which children have been disposed through appealing to the objectivity, civility, and benevolent principles of their professions. So today's presentation emerges um, from some very new thinking I'm doing around the figure of the experimented upon feral child, a child who cannot be assimilated into the social order and its institutions despite repeated attempts, and this child's centrality to shaping futures for per persons and populations besides them. I'm interested in how figures of feral children are often racially marked, sexualized, and pathologized, but become suddenly novel subjects for analysis in the 20th century with the emergence of developmental psychology as a, as a specialized subfield. Um, so today I'm going to discuss the case of Jeannie, who was also dubbed the wild child. 
Jeannie was the pseudonym given to a child who was horrifically abused and lived in isolation until she was 13. Um, in a household with her mother, father, and brother, she was locked in a room alone all day and had virtually no human interaction for at least the first 10 years of her life. In 1970, she was rescued from her home in California and admitted to Children's Hospitals Los Angeles. Here, Jeannie had a treatment team of psychologists, doctors, teachers, therapists, and social workers. The psychologists were able to secure grants from the National Institute of Mental Health to study Jeannie for both research and rehabilitation purposes. Members of the team fought vigorously over the best setting for Jeannie. She lived at the hospital for a time, but then moved in with team members in a foster capacity until her 18th birthday, at which point she left where she was being fostered and circulated in and out of foster homes and other group homes. The following is a typical narrative that one of her team members reproduced frequently to describe both her discovery and her potential. On November 4th, 1970, a 13-year-old child who had been the victim of extreme isolation for 10 years was admitted to Children's Hospital LA. At that time, she was unable to stand erect, lacked speech, did not know how to choose solid or even semi-solid food, and generally her appearance and behavior manifested a bizarre and profound experience of extreme physical and psychological neglect and social isolation. The changes which have occurred since that time to when this was being written in March 1972 are remarkable. Her comprehension of language, her expressive speech, and her understanding of concepts and cognitive relations have shown tremendous advances. Her potential for development is, of course, still unknown. So this description captures both the feral construction of Jeannie, all of the ways that she lacked normative human ability to walk, talk, eat, and perform basic functions, and the treatment team's attempt to rehabilitate her into the category of the human. Jeannie's very embodiment posed a threat to universal theories of child development. In the early years of her institutionalization, the adults surrounding her wanted desperately to get her to inhabit the category of the human, speaking optimistically about her tremendous advances and unknown potential. Her team members invited other researchers to come and study Jeannie. They remarked repeatedly on this, quote, unfortunate but scientifically interesting child, um, a phrase that recurs a lot in kind of materials about her, which captures the way that her horrific upbringing was being framed as an opportunity for knowledge production and advancement. At the time that she was institutionalized, Jeannie was considered a modern-day feral child. One of her team members, when recounting her story to another researcher two years after her rescue, wrote, A search of relevant literature on isolated and feral children suggests that no comparable case of prolonged isolation has been reported for more than a century, and that the continuing story of this child's development has important relevance for theories of child development. So this passage captures the ways that the uniqueness of Jeannie's status as feral was seen as valuable, again, because of its potential to contribute to social scientific knowledge. In a documentary pre um, that was produced about this case, Dr. Susan Curtis, a graduate student at the time of Jeannie's rescue, who was assigned to her team, appeared at the film's opening um, in her present day, which is the 1990s, and she's teaching an undergraduate psychology class. In a lesson on language acquisition, she introduces the case of Jeannie by stating, quote, a genie is a creature that comes out of a bottle and emerges into human society with no past childhood. We assume a genie is a creature that had no human childhood, end quote. So Curtis's linking of Jeannie, the girl with this folkloric figure, specifically introduces Jeannie as a racialized other and foregrounds the problems of her humanity, development, and time. Jeannie the child was out of time in the eyes of authority figures and professionals who managed her. Situating her in time was difficult because of all of the unknowns of her situation. The continual iteration of her, the unknowns of Jeannie's case, enabled her to be a malleable figure for the researchers that approached her. Based on how she was or was not progressing, they could project imaginings into these unknown gaps in her history, making the future of Jeannie that which retroactively constructed and affirmed her very amorphous pasts. The documentary brings together uh, modern day interviews, old interviews, newspaper clippings, documents, and most prominently, clinical footage of Jeannie as she was being studied, tested, and experimented on in order to demonstrate the massive anxiety, curiosity, and ambition that Jeannie provoked in the adults around her. The documentary reveals the challenges and struggles that Jeannie and her future faced in being approached simultaneously as a patient, a testing subject, a foster child, and a professional opportunity. Was she being treated and or studied? Was there investment in situating her back in time? And if so, was this the time of teleological human development or the time of indefinite suspended experimental childhood? 
Given the critical acclaim of the film, as well as its ongoing pedagogical purchase, um, it appears on countless psychology syllabi, both for its detailing of this case study, as well as for its commentary, meta or otherwise, on the ethics debates that Jeannie's case uh, sparked in and since the 1970s. I magnify her case to consider the ways that her story has, considered, has continued to circulate. Um, so for the purposes of the rest of our, my presentation today, I'm going to focus on how the sexual dimension of Jeannie's ferality was constructed and represented, as well as its role in disciplining her and her future. And I'm going to do this by looking at two filmic representations. So this documentary, uh, which was produced in 1994 um, and won an Emmy Award, and then a 2001 independent film, Mockingbird Don't Sing. So fascinatingly, the documentary doesn't name the sexual construction of Jeannie's ferality, but it alludes to it through, the, through its recirculation of archival footage of Jeannie. In many of the clips, Jeannie is in various physical states where some of her clothing and garments are exposed in ways that would be considered inappropriate when it comes to white 13-year-old girls and their bodies. While depicting her in these states is not inherently sexualizing, it suggests Jeannie is not due the privacy and respect that others of her age and race would be granted. Now, this is perhaps due in part to the emphasis on Jeannie's infantileness. Her mental and linguistic ages are constantly being named and measured and are considered well below her physical age, which also doesn't quite align with her chronological age. And these are all named as um, factors in her peculiar gait and her way of interacting with the environment. Uh, so being out of sync with normative child development justifies a violating clinical gaze on Jeannie's body. That these exposures are often a result of Jeannie's actions, which are described by members of her team as almost inhuman characteristics um, and accompanied by descriptions of her strange bunny walk and not infrequent spitting and clawing, constructs Jeannie's uh, physical ferality as sexual. The visual allusions to the sexual construction of Jeannie's ferality are of note, given the documentary's decision to not name the professional's preoccupation with Jeannie's sexual history, sexual acts, and sexual maturity. The documentary is largely based on journalist. Oh, sorry, these are the two things I'm looking at. <laughs> the, it's largely based on journalist Russ Reimer's um, 1993 book *Genie: An Abused Child's Flight from Silence*, which earned him a Whiting Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Here and elsewhere, there are minor but significant mentions of Genie's relationship to sex and its role in determining her ability to progress. Jeannie's team was, for example, very concerned with her frequent masturbation. One of her teachers attempted to foster Jeannie for a summer, and she made it her mission to dispel Jeannie's bad habits among the masturbation, which she detailed in her diary. Turning to the archive, one of her team members wrote in May 1971, improved nutrition and the enriched environment at the hospital have resulted not only in weight gain, but in recent signs of approaching puberty, such as breast buds, in accordance with the patient's chronological age. Mrs. Block commented on the difficult situation bound to arise with Jeannie developing object relationships at the same time she was entering puberty and possibly experiencing two-year-old negativism simultaneously with adolescent rebellion. Dr. Freeman thought that the pubertal awareness would be minimal due to the patient's scarce experience and was surprised to learn that it is already manifest. Twice recently, Jeannie has pulled up her dress and taken Dr. Kent's hand, placing it on her stomach and then pushing it between her legs. She has also pulled up women's dresses, exploring, and was once observed rubbing her genitalia while asleep. So here, there's anxiety over Jeannie's multiple times. Uh, she's potentially going through two developmental stages simultaneously, according to this team member, and he's concerned that it's going to lead to warped attachments and distort her emotional growth. Um, and at the same time, he's trying to figure out how her age is and isn't informing, uh, and her experience is and isn't informing what she's capable of doing and exploring. So I'm interested in the documentary's decision to not name the sexual dimensions while also encoding it through its recirculation of archival footage. The documentary might be attempting to not violate and incur the very harm that its medium was critiquing these professionals and institutions of committing. The silence around Jeannie's sexuality in this teaching tool could be a way to try to safeguard Jeannie in ways that she was not across her youth. It also might be anticipating audience objections to the story. Perhaps presenting Jeannie an explicit connection to sexuality would reduce sympathy and compassion for her case, which pivots on rehabilitating her as a human child. The documentary ultimately claims that Jeannie was not viewed as a human child, but pri primarily as a scientific object. So to preserve and rescue her child identity, they must preserve the ideals of American childhood sexual innocence. So the documentary's occlusion of these details differs from the dramatized film of Jeannie's life, Mockingbird Don't Sing. Um, so this was an independent film released in 2001, which had some modest critical reception on the film in the film festival circuit. 
While the names of all persons are changed, uh, Jeannie is Katie in the film. Well, Jeannie's already a pseudonym, but she's Katie in the film. For ease, I'm just going to keep referring to her as Jeannie. Um, the film is a direct depiction of Jeannie's life and even shares key scenes and lines from the documentary. While it relies on scripted dramatic scenes to convey virtually the same information, there is one key difference between the two depictions, and that is the inclusion and even dramatic liberty with Jeannie's sexuality, but more specifically, her heterosexuality. So the film explicitly discusses and represents Jeannie's masturbation. In one early scene, she's in a car with two members of her team. One looks back and reports that she's masturbating, and the camera cuts to the child pleasuring herself under her clothes. There's something between an uncomfortable look and grin that's exchanged between the two team members, and there's no additional commentary. Later in the film, Jeannie menstruates for the first time, um, which is something that the team had been waiting for so that they could finally test a particular linguistic theory that had been tied with puberty. Shortly after this, Jeannie begins attending school in a class with much younger children. Um, she's picked up by a school bus, and um, uh, I'm not going to show the clip, um, but basically when she gets on the bus, there is a really intense visual exchange between Jeannie and the bus driver that's scored by flowery flowery music and very dramatic cuts between the two that zoom closer and closer in on both Jeannie and the bus driver's face. Um, so this is a very significant and bizarre departure from the tone of the film. And at first, see, yeah, um, first seems to suggest that something inappropriate will happen between the two. It's very reminiscent of Stanley Kubrick's uh, Lolita. Um, but as the scene progresses, Jeannie refuses to let go of the driver when she gets off the bus. Um, and everyone's kind of like uncomfortable, but also laughing while this is happening. Uh, so the depiction of Jeannie's crush with her inappropriate attachment demonstrates that she's starting to enter an appropriate developmental phase of heterosexual girlhood, but she's not yet fully inhabiting that phase. The film tries to demonstrate Jeannie's normative development by depicting the equivalent of a girlhood crush, but also acknowledging her struggles to fully enter this phase. For a film that's so rigorous in honoring its source material, the emphasis on Jeannie's heterosexuality in relation to its fidelity to other dimension of, dimensions of Jeannie's case is perhaps this film's attempts to, you know, un, to humanize Jeannie in ways that she wasn't in real life. When Jeannie was 18, the National Institute of Mental Health, which had been funding the study for about six years, withdrew its funding. It had given numerous warnings to Jeannie's team and withdrew funding ultimately because no work or knowledge had actually been produced about Jeannie by the metrics that were meaningful to the NIMH. The hundreds of hours recording Jeannie uh, were not properly cataloged. Little work had been published on her during this multi-year study. Tests that she was undergoing were not properly adhering to scientific protocols and methods for validity. The list goes on. When the funding stopped, she was initially returned to her abusive mother and then was in and out of abusive foster care homes until she was finally returned to a different facility for adults. Legal battles ensued as her mother accused the research team of exploiting Jeannie during her childhood and abandoning her the moment that she stopped making progress, which coincided her with becoming an adult according to chronological age. While the anxiety over situating Jeannie in time extended during her childhood, chronological age trumps here. Her childhood expires, as does continued investment in seeing her potential. In the film's depiction of this portion of Jeannie's life, one team member visits Jeannie at her foster home. She asks Jeannie if she wants to see her boyfriend, and Jeannie is non-responsive. So the impact of the ultimate abandonment of Jeannie is depicted through her regression of heterosexual interest and the return of her compulsive habits. The film eschews silence around Jeannie's sexuality and instead uses sexuality to demonstrate growth and progress and ultimately to demand respect for Jeannie, regardless of whether she was a child or adult, but because she was human. So kind of concluding here, uh, traumatized and abused children are the bedrock of many universal theories of childhood. The racial, sexual, and gendered constructions of these children have enabled the white, asexual, bourgeois dimensions of universalization. Some marginalized children's abilities to grow, advance, or progress have been sacrificed by institutions and professional fields to advance the futures of persons considered more worthy of citizenship, rights, safety, health, and humanity. Their cases are canonical in psychology and health curricula today. Stories continually redeploy to teach and uphold state-sanctioned modes of personhood and belonging. 
Studying cases like Jeannie's helps to uncover a larger historical pattern that draws our attention to the ways that institutions relate to vulnerable children in order to manage which persons and populations get access to a future and under what conditions, as well as the role of sexuality um, in this case in simultaneously constructing ferality, bolstering innocence, rehabilitating the feral child, and humanizing the feral child. Like my first project, this is a project about queer children, but more importantly, it's an argument about queer childhoods, how temporal experiences have been institutionally manufactured during the time of childhood that impact how children can move into social, political, and economic futures. The queer childhoods produced in these institutions have enabled the forward-moving progressive timeline of the nation. These childhoods have secured American futures in which children and the adults they become have not been full-fledged citizens or participants. Scholarship on queer temporality and these projects' participation in that scholarship by shifting our focus from children to childhood is crucial for seeing how the constructions of personhood, belonging, and citizenship are built on these children's institutional and sexual experiences. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Um, it's a, it's just such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, Penn is a place that has really um, held me and I'm so grateful to Melissa and to David and Heather and so many other mentors. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's just, um, it's, it's profoundly special. Um, riffing on what Mary was saying a little bit, you know, it's also just great to be here on this kind of occasion of multiple temporalities and, and kind of coinciding anniversaries. Um, uh, you, my talk today is going to be entitled aiming for an alternative sexuality studies with Richard Bruce Nugent's gentleman jigger. Today, I'm going to present a little bit from my current book project, which is called sexual aim and it's misses which offers a new historiographical method for narrating the history of sexuality, moving away from the focus on object choice based sexuality, so prevalent in scholarship and sexuality studies to consider what I call aim based sexuality. Sigmund Freud coins the term sexual aim to describe modes of gratification, the sexual acts in which one finds pleasure, kissing, copulation, voyeurism, exhibitionism, sadism, masochism, fetishism, etc. He understands aim as one of two elements that compose sexual desire with the um with the other element being the the sexual object or or the person or thing which will enable the achieving of the aim. While for Freud desires composed of, of object, the, the person to whom you're attracted and aim what you want to do to or with uh, them, uh, historians of sexuality have conceptualized our sexual system almost exclusively in terms of object, mm -hmm. um, organized by the poles of hetero and homosexuality. My book seeks to redress this omission, contending that while sexual object choice functions as sexuality's dominant and, and public face, sexual aim functions as sexuality's most familiar system of, of what I'm going to call its secondary diacritical uh, demarcation. This more private, less prominent role is nonetheless essential to understanding the history of modern sexuality as aim furnishes a constitutive and almost wholly forgotten governing logic of sexuality one that's uneasily incorporated into the hetero homo binary over the course of the 20th century. It's a logic that traverses the hetero homo binary since it's not object based and thus sexual aims emergence and subsequent medicalization bring together histories of the hetero and homoerotic uh, practice in a way that's, that's rarely uh, explored in, in the history of sexuality. My paper takes up Richard Bruce Nugent's Gentleman Jigger, a, a little known Harlem Renaissance text, um, which has received a kind of um, a handful of treatments in, in relation to homosexuality. Today, I hope to demonstrate that tracing its channels of desire along the lines of aim is, is far more productive for theorizing the novel and its uh, 
uh, relation to generic form. Uh, it's a Ramona Clay, um, so a kind of novel with a key, which which has kind of uh, a kind of fictional uh, or sort of fi fake fictional representations of real people and events. Um, written between 1928 and 1933 and remaining unpublished until 2008, Nugent's text features many of the most important personages of the Harlem Renaissance. The first half of the novel has a plot that's nearly identical to its twin text, Walls Thurman's Infants of the Spring from 1932. Uh, Nugent and Thurman were, were roommates. Um, this part of the novel depicts the Nugent character, Stuart, loafing, drinking, searching for food and more drink, lackadaisically writing, and above all, opining and conversing on race, sexuality, and money uh, with his friends, friends represented uh, by Ramona Clay versions of Walls Thurman, Zora Neale Hurston, Aaron Douglas, and, and other, known, uh, other kind of lesser known figures. The second half of the novel depicts Stuart's sexual adventures with Italian men, many of them gangsters. The novel is scandalous and disreputable in the way that Sean Latham theorizes the genre of the Romana Clay, flirting with libel in its, quote, blurring the boundary between fact and fiction. It's Latham. Its representation of sexuality is even more daring and would have certainly exceeded what was lawful under the Comstock Act during the period, um, depicting masochism, non-dyadic sexuality, incestuous feelings, pederastic rape, fellatio, and male homosexuality. While the limited body of work on sexuality in relation to Gentleman Jigger focuses on what Arnold Rampersan calls its representation of, quote, male homosexuality, and Jeremy Braddock terms its, quote, queer sexuality. My reading foregrounds its entwinement of exhibitionism and racial fetishism. I will argue that the novel flauntingly exhibits and fetishizes itself as a Ramona Clay, theorizing and embodying these aim-based sexualities. Such interdigitation between genre and sexuality comes to the fore in a scene where some of the members of Nugent's coterie try to determine and classify Stuart's sexual preferences. While the narrator repeatedly characterizes Stuart as a, quote, exhibitionist in free and direct discourse, suggesting his self-conception as such, and his friends refer to him as an exhibitionist as well, they continually stage Stuart's sexuality as a mystery. Although the characterization of exhibitionism would seem to preclude the possibility of his sexuality being mysterious, since exhibitionism is so manifestly displayed, Rusty, the Thurman character, explains it with the following rhetorical question. Can one ever tell who he is most interested in? He's much too frank in his delights and interests to be anything more than confusing. Here, Stuart's frankness, his exhibitionism in the diegesis of the novel, confounds the recognizable grids of sexuality. That is, Rusty and their other friends repeatedly insist on positioning Stuart within the hetero-homo binary, unable to acknowledge or recognize the sexuality of his aim-based desire. Its demarcating system doesn't register for them, even as they uh, aver his exhibitionism, if not his racial fetishism. Their certainty about positioning Stuart as either heterosexual or homosexual crescendos when they find a letter addressed to, quote, Bob, located with apparent meaning between, quote, the, eight, the 68th and 69th pages of Proust, um, where Proust's name here, of course, uh, is functioning as a period signifier for homosexuality. Bob is a sobriquet that Stuart uses for both Bobby Frere and Bobby Soir, a pair of brother and sister twins who are identical in every way from apart from their sex, like the position 69 itself, Stuart's friends are determined to uncover the nature of Stuart's relation to Bob, querying, you must have a preference. After all, one is a woman and the other is a man. Stuart rejoins, all the less reason for a preference. A woman satisfies one need and a man another. They really are to be enjoyed in entirely different manners. Stewart suggests that they, quote, play Sherlock Holmes and present both Bobs with identical copies of the letter at dinner in front of everyone. 
The reference here to Sherlock Holmes summons a number of Arthur Conan Doyle stories like A Case of Identity, The Adventures of Black Peter, our advertisement brings a visitor, in which Holmes either sends a letter or places an advertisement as a lure in order to test the reaction of his addressee. The siblings are each presented their letter to read on condition that they burn them immediately after reading, and the twins' faces reveal nothing to this band of Watsons, quote, each expression duplicated as in a mirror. Stuart's sexuality is here represented as a riddle, non-dyadic in the sense that it is neither hetero or homosexual, but also in as much as it could also be triangular, going to bed with um, the twins jointly or separately, and possibly incestuous or alternatively non-sexual in the sense that going to bed might just entail sleeping beside. Indeed, shortly after this incident, the reader learns that Stuart has never engaged in a genital sexual act with a man. The letter, which is described jocularly as a, quote, revelation, is presented as a textual key ostent ostentatiously offering Stuart's friends the kind of device that is similarly supposed to unpick the lock of the Ramona clay. In so doing, Nugent referentially calls attention to the genre's fetishization of such keys while brandishing them in a dramatic display of exhibitionism, complete with the empty signifier of a letter already read being twice burned. Such burning uh, highlights the letter's existence as both diegetic, as its text is transcribed in the novel, and also at least imaginatively extra diegetic in as much as Stuart keeps the original version, quote, to go in the novel. This dual ontology constitutes another act of generic bravado, since as Latham makes clear, a novel, quote, becomes a Ramona Clay only through the introduction of a key that lies beyond the diegesis itself. These exhibitionist displays amplify a queer potentiality that Latham sees as latent in the genre. This is Latham again, quote, it is not that those who possess a key gain access to a publicly authenticated history preceding and textualization. Indeed, paradoxically, they find themselves locked inside a labyrinthine text, finding that though in possession of a key, they cannot be certain which doors open onto fact and which onto fancy. In the Ramona Clay, every key threatens to be in a kind of imaginary or broken key. We never learn Bobby Frere or Bobby Soir's names or the names of the potentially real people they represent. Likewise, no key seems to unlock the secret of Stuart's sexuality. Perhaps the riddle of Stuart's sexuality remains unsolvable for these would-be Sherlocks because they're looking for a hidden object choice when his um, aim-based desires are in plain view, an open secret exhibited by Stuart with dramatic flair at every turn. The novel even more boldly flaunts its exhibitionist and fetishized relation to keys in its depiction of Stuart wearing a, quote, golden key around his neck, a remembrance from an earlier night of intermingled lust and violence with the Italian gangster Orini. In this scene, Stuart disrobes, exposing the key to or 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 Orini's gambling den. Stuart, the exhibitionist, not realizing he's wearing the key in front of uh, Orini, blushes at its revelation as though Nugent himself is blushing at his own generic bravado, for Stuart claims the key is, quote, for luck. All but, all but revealing that Orini is the lucky Luciano character in the novel. Um, but the key is also a fetish in the materialist sense, mediating differential value systems in the way William Peets points out, and the extent to which Stuart values the key surprises him as he recognizes, quote, how great Orini's hold over him was. Orini sees the key as valueless in a financial sense to Stuart or even possessing negative value as Stuart loses all of his enormous winnings at Orini's gambling establishment on, quote, one fool bet. <laughs> However, Stuart knew he would lose, but made the bet to gain the friendship and trust and eventually the promise of marriage from Wayne, quote, uh, who's, uh, which, and Wayne is a woman, 
whose family and tradition spelt America and prestige, producing as it had several presidents and many statesmen and governors, close quote. Thus, the golden key is literally Stuart's entree into the highest echelons of whiteness and white aristocracy. The key also represents another kind of fetishism, racial fetishism, emblematizing Stuart's near exclusive aim-based desire for Italianness. The second half of the novel, which has received virtually no sustained scholarly attention, features Stuart's relationship with and sexual encounters with a variety of, quote, Italian hoodlums, Ray, Frank, Orini, Tony, etc. As Matthew Fry Jacobson has argued, Italians didn't have a strong claim to whiteness during the Harlem Renaissance. Italians, quote, swarthy complexion combined with their willingness to live, work, fraternize, and marry black people gave them a racial identity proximate to blackness. Stewart understands Italians in this racialized register, noting, quote, they're a dark race and I like dark races. He doubles the racialization of this fetishized class by wondering, quote, if gangsters were a race, concluding they very likely were. He exhibitionately, ex exhibitionately flaunts his love of Italians as an, at an Italian restaurant in Little Italy, declaring, come on, see me be a sensation on Prince Street. Once there, he flirts with the waiter and ostent ostentatiously declares, I prefer Italians. To help the reader understand Stewart's fetishism, the novel offers a number of interconnected ideologies for his, quote, racial preference, claiming that the Italian gangsters antisociality, their openness to life outside the law has made them more accepting and understanding of alternative ways of being in the world. Unlike most people, the Italians, quote, do not, Stuart explains, confuse gender with sex when sex is the important thing. Here, sex signifies sexual acts rather than biological sex, meaning that Italians are open to, quote, satisfaction of the sexual urge without requiring that the satisfaction align with the symbolic meanings many people associate with sexuality, reproduction, um, what the novel calls reproduction. But this stated reason does not quite account for his fetishization of Italians, which is instead hinted at when Stewart explains that Italians, quote, fulfill so many of the promises Negroes hold for me, promises never fulfilled by Negroes, maybe because of a lack in myself. It's a lack I can very likely thank my blonde blood for, close quote. Here, Stewart seems to suggest that the difference of his, quote, blonde blood disrupts the affective and communal fellow feeling he dreams of with other black people. Sometimes something he feels with Italians who are culturally coded as existing between the black and white worlds as Stuart himself is. But the blonde blood in Stuart's family also separates him from his mother Palma and his brother e Aeon, who both pass as white, so much so that he can't contact his mother for fear of exposing her race at his brother's death. Here's the passage about that. The most terrible change had been Aeon's death. Aeon had been killed in a terrible traffic accident. Before, it had never seemed to Stuart that anything could really happen to change his family or that nebulous, tenacious, mutual regard so a part of each of them. Stuart sent his mother no word at Aeon's death, but Pama sent him a leather-bound journal in which Aeon had written up until the very hour of his death. And Stuart put it away and tried to readjust himself. Stuart, who had never before thought consciously of readjustment. This readjustment, as I understand it, takes the form of his newly acquired fetish for Italian men, which is absent from uh, the first half of the novel. The Italian men are sincere and, quote, fundamentally honest traits that Stuart shares and associates with black people and provide a kind of melancholic fetishistic attachment through which Stuart can route the loss of community and love that his family's separation riven by white blood and the allure of passing has caught has cost him. This melancholic fetish seems to provide the condition for Stuart's flourishing 
as though his attachment to his family was one not of cruel optimism, but of static contentment. Rusty describes him shortly after Aeon's death by saying, quote, you haven't seen him lately. He's blossomed, blossomed into a beauty. Really, I'd never thought of him as being so terribly good looking either, but now there's a sort of aura almost around him. Here, Stewart's fetish enchants him with its magic as he incorporates his melancholic attachment to Aeon and his lost ties to his mother into himself. In connecting his sexuality to his family, the novel adheres to a sexological logic in which heredity is connected to the etiology of putatively non-normative desires, as though the novel were a case history from Richard uh, von Croft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis, to which Stewart notes his similarity to the symptoms, quote, manifested in 127 cases. Its opening page begins with a very precise and detailed accounting of his racial and sexual lineage. His mother, Palma, for example, is described in the following way, quote, despite these tainting and tinting bloods, drops of Negro blood, and a few American Indian ancestors, the fair and personable Palma possessed in great majority the necessary number of polymorphonucleorites to assure the anemic and inbred pallor of true aristocracy in her offspring. Close quote. Following Laura Doyle's claim that race is at its base the idea that characteristics are passed from one generation to the next, we can understand that the hereditary and cellular description of Seward's ancestry suggests his attachment to Aeon and his family is a particularly racial one. For this reason, Stewart's fetish also cathects on race, one rather than say, you know, shoes or hair, because race is, after all, the sexual formation closest to what Michel mm -hmm. Foucault terms the deployment of alliance. Thus, Stewart's fetishism for Italians is a way to work through, to begin to search the riveting effects of Jim Crow on his family. The novel ends with a metaphoric restitution or reparation for the theft of black labor and traumatic severing of familiar units under slavery. And as Christina Sharp puts it mm -hmm. in its wake, that is, this is all set in motion when a man bursts into Stewart's Broadway rehearsal and Stewart makes a large donation to an organization helping the Scottsboro boys in front of everyone. When asked about it by a gossip columnist, he unguardedly reveals his blackness after passing by saying, quote, it's news if a Negro helps a Negro, close quote. Though on the eve of becoming a huge movie star, he feels a pleasure in this unexpected happening, quote, he had gained rather than lost. It was a new excitement. Here, Stewart transforms what those closest to him perceive as a racial wound into what Jennifer Nash describes as a moment of, quote, racialized excitement or instance of surprising pleasures in racialization, one that carries the erotic charge of his exhibitionism. The shape of the exhibitionism here is different, however, for in the div divulgement of his racial identity, his desire for connection is not cross-racial, but that of, quote, a Negro helping a Negro. After having disclosed his racial identity, Stewart makes the representatives of the studio, quote, pay dearly for a release from the three-year contract they had forced him on him. If under slavery, white men stole the labor of black captives through force, here Stuart reverses the thefts of slavery by making those white men who forced him into a contract, a document which can by definition not be legal under coercion, pay him rather than their fellow white men an exorbitant fee, nearly $100,000 for labor that he will not perform for them. Here, blackness is valued with an, a vengeance, enabling a, quote, pleased and slightly malicious smile to tip Stewart's lips. If the fetish is fundamentally about a contest over value and valuation, Stewart seemingly ends the story triumphant, proving that whiteness is a, quote, inflated commodity. And yet the slightness of Stewart's smile suggests the pyrrhic nature of his victory, one that seems so trivial in relation to the weight of slavery and Jim Crow. As I hope my reading of the novel has made clear, a turn from object to aim 
promises to rewire the whole historiography of uh, sexuality. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ava, Mary, and Benji. So we started 10 minutes late, so I'm going to take the prerogative of doing Q&A for 15 minutes. Um, is that all right, Melissa? It's perfect. So I'm sure there are many, many questions, but I will invoke my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question, which is simply, uh, one, thank you. Your papers were amazing. I think there are a lot of interconnections. I actually would love for you to talk with each other. And I'll try to frame it uh, in a way that just creates a number of questions across your presentations. It really struck me that you are all exploring the future of identity and desire for the social and for the law. And you do that through various case histories, whether you think about them globally or historically, or in terms of the narrative novel. And in thinking of the problem of the relationship between identity and desire in queer and trans studies, I think about one major turn in theory, which was Eve Sedgwick's, you know, How to Raise Your Kids Gay, where she says the precise depathologization of homosexuality and its object choice um, created another regime, which is gender identity disorder. So precisely when the DSM-3 depathologized homosexuality and object choice, it repathologized gender identity and behavior. And this, in a way, I think becomes one of the nodal points for the emergence of trans. And so I was starting from Ava's presentation. Um, what I think is fascinating about trans is that unlike homo and heterosexuality, all bets are off between identity and object, right? That there's no real alignment of the ident sexual identity and object choice. And that, I was wondering, is that intrinsic to non-binary? And so I was just thinking about the way in which your presentation very much was about the way in which the law tried to really manage the problem of non-binary and still, you know, from the various legal debates, create a, and stabilize an identity um, from that. And the way in which, you know, that works is through a kind of developmental narrative, whether you want to think about it in terms of Mary's case history on Jeannie, or whether you want to think about those kind of identity coordinates in relation to a much larger system, structural system of development, whether it's transitional economies, transitional democracy, uh, transitional justice on the global scale. And what I find fascinating about that is that it brings back this whole history of the human. And you know that was at the heart, I think, of your discussion. Mary, I think theoretically, um, Benji's introducing something to the discussion of sexuality, identity, desire, object choice, which is where does aim fit within all those, um, within all those discourses? Um, and is aim one way to think about how the deconstructive nature um, of trans and the impulse to reconstruct that identity under the law, you know, what does aim bring to that discussion that we haven't had in the field before? So, you know, that, those are, these are very unformed thoughts, but this is the general idea and the framing that I really got from your marvelous presentations. So I would like to open that just for you to talk first amongst yourselves, and then we can turn it over to the audience. Wow, that was a conversation, Scott. <laughs> I'm just absorbing it all. No, I mean it was such a it was such a brilliant question. I think um, so. I think you know. I think we're all taking it in. Um, I, I yeah. I mean, I think uh, so many uh, kind of uh, kind of fascinating questions. Yeah, I I think you know for me um, in terms of thinking about 
uh, transness, you know, Hirschfeld is kind of thinking about, uh, you know, kind of cross-dressing as a kind of sexual aim, which is not, you know, usually a register that kind of, um, uh, that, that, that kind of, uh, trans studies tends to think in too, too often. Um, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are you all having trouble hearing me? Um, yeah. So, um, I was just saying that, that Hirschfeld, um, kind of often thinks about, um, uh, kind of cross-dressing as a, as a sexual aim, which is, which is not, uh, you know, a kind of that, that transness as a kind of like erotic act is, is not necessarily, um, always the, um, kind of frame of, of contemporary, um, queer studies, but on, on David's kind of point about, um, uh, Cedric's essay, I think is, is so fascinating both because, um, of the way that that essay has become a real flashpoint in, in queer stuff in, in trans studies, right. So that, um, you know, a number of, um, uh, uh, kind of prominent theorists in trans studies, um, from, you know, Grace Lavery to, um, uh, Jules Gil Peterson and, and stuff have really, um, have taken that essay to task for its kind of, um, transphobia at the, at the same time that I think, um, Cedric was, I think, you know, also kind of trying to, um, think about ways that the ideological kind of frame, um, could also be a kind of, um, uh, pro queer frame rather than, um, one that was necessarily pathologizing. So. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, David, for the question and Benji for kind of getting us started. Um, the well, what I really like about the idea of aim and something I want to be th that I in both projects I'm thinking about is this relationship between like adults' desire for what children's futures and by extension identities should look like versus what they actually look like, right? So it's and the words that I've been playing with are like you know shaping but not over determining, like orienting toward, and so an orientation is kind of a, a way that I've been thinking about that. But I really like how you're introducing aim to that, and I think it's interesting both in terms of like this particular case because of this chronological and physical but also like these um un uneven and kind of ever shifting um like intellectual and developmental ages of genie um are across her adolescence there's this it keep the adults desires for her identity in the future keep shifting right like will she become a, uh, will, will everything eventually ultimately sync up? And if they don't, what do they do with her, right? Um, and I also think those are really interesting questions in terms of trans childhood today. And, I, you know, I was thinking you brought up this relationship between children's rights and parents' rights, and then mm -hmm. kind of ways that adults might sometimes harness children's desires in order to fit into kind of again some like predetermined trajectory for what identity should look like that will ultimately sync and align with something that is mm -hmm. normative right and that's mm -hmm. not to say that that doesn't align with what the children do or don't want but like how how are adults kind of helping to to create certain kinds of aims that are ultimately about securing um the stability of certain kinds of categories or futures so yeah, yeah. um yeah thank you david for you introduced a lot, so I'm trying to like <laughs> piece it together. I um yeah, there is a lot of crossover. I think yeah, I'm thinking again with that Amin essay um in relation to aim because one of his contentions, you know, and that essay was um, controversial at least on Twitter, um, <laughs> and uh, but he says I'm. It's not the exact phrasing, but something that's like transition is what makes visible the distance between the body and identification. And I think if we're talking about object choice, in the case of transition and the terms that Amin is working with, so much of it is about um, manifesting, right, an I idealized self, even while trans people, trans communities, and trans studies has really, is exhausted with having to engage with the genre of transition at all. And so, yeah, I think there's something about AIM that sort of de-idealizes the, the ideal self or that object that's use, really useful. And, and yeah, Mary, to your point, I think um, 
so much of the discourse around trans children is about trying to uh, really assert that sort of stabilized um, transition, that there is a clear starting point and end point, mm -hmm. and has largely been determined by the discourse mm -hmm. of that legislation. And, and that's kind of what I'm getting at with the trap. It's like, we have to do it, but like, it's, it's so frustrating. It does all of the normative things that y'all are talking about. Um, and, but, but yeah, it does modify the sort of like um, object relations and desire mm -hmm. very differently when it's about self and like mm -hmm. a particular mirrored self that doesn't exist and that you know is a problem in the first place. So, okay, that's all I got. No, I, that's great. And um, I'm going to turn over to the audience. I'm going to say one quick thing because I, I actually think listening to your responses that the kind of um, sublation of aim into transition, right? I mean, you could say in a way that transition is the legal term that tries to capture the detours of aim in order to channel things into a proper object and a proper subject, mm -hmm. right? And so I, what I think is like fascinating about aim is the way in which um, though the law tries to legislate the fastest path uh, between, let's say, identity and object choice or identity and desire, um, transition and aim are very unruly, right? And they uh, can extend, refuse, uh, cir circulate, and it's a very circuitous, right, uh, desire for a kind of alignment that the subject itself refuses in the face of the law. You know, and I've always thought that what's so fascinating about the law and desire is that the law really wants to produce desire, but desire, and it's, and it's so overdetermined, but of course, desire is also the category that is the most unruly, right? Despite all the social conditioning, all the social laws, desire c constantly exceeds, right, what the law wants for it. Um, so let's turn it to the audience, and um, I see lots of hands, so Jess? And thanks so much for your talks. Um, my question is mostly for Mary, but also for Ava. And it's kind of about failures of empathy. And I was thinking about this, partly I'm reading this book, uh, Skin Theory by Christina Mejias Vesperas about uh, um, Kligman here and uh, his experiments with the carceral population at Holmesburg. And she talks about this brief moment where he's like, wow, I really am an asshole for working on this like carceral population, <laughs> but there's such a perfect test case for my experiments. And I, so she writes about the failure of empathy there. And I was a little bit also interested, Ava, when you were talking about um, Lindsay, I think his name was, and how he moves past this desire for empathy, but with this very medicalized display. And so I was kind of wondering about the relationship between, you know, so you have Jeannie, and I was curious if any of her, you know, these scientists and these psychologists who come in, if they have any of these moments of like, guilt about their lack of empathy for this person as they kind of as she's her, her this perfect case for like oh finally she's at puberty so we can see if this theory holds up you know so um, there, my question isn't born fully but it's something about the relationship between bodies misaligned you know uh you know sexual desire and science and evidence and and where that all fits in uh, yeah, great question. And something again, it kind of comes up in both projects because, like, in the boarding schools, so many of the educators, um, kind of in their testimonies or talk, like, and also even in a lot of student materials about it, do speak to really relationships that are really endowed with care, right? And like that, that's happening in the context though of like this larger, these larger violences, right? Um, and and yeah, and in the case of Jeannie, it's so, it's really some of, I wasn't able to incorporate a lot of, I was just at the special collections at UCLA, which houses kind of all the material about her. And, um, you know, there is a lot of, like in the same sentence that they'll be talking about how, you know, she's so part of the, like the psychologist and her teacher were married and they um, uh, fostered her for a number of years and we talking about how like she, she's part of the family like one of the kids and look at her relationship with her older brothers but then at the same time being like how great that we have 24-hour 
like around the clock surveillance on her to be like really seeing how these things are playing out like in a real live setting that like maybe she will be in one day and so there is you know so i think it's um you know of course we know like intention and outcome and stuff are, are just really um vexed have very vexed relationships and so it's it's, it's really thorny and, and stuff that i'm always kind of trying to figure out and also that I'm also always thinking about as, as me as someone who's like accessing these materials and trying to construct these narratives. And so, um, and so I, I don't really have necessarily an answer, but it is hard and also as an outsider to witness, but uh, to, to witness and watch and then to be trying to, to navigate what that looks like. Right. So I, just to say, I, uh, thanks for kind of putting some of that stuff on my radar as well. So. Um, yeah, uh, just really quickly in the in the Lindsay Sparrow example, I think I'll add that um, because it was a hearing about preventing children from accessing healthcare, um, and Lindsay Sparrow, though young, is not a child. Um, there's part of what I find interesting about the disruption of that moment is that the child is hovering somewhere still as the victim of a supposed like trans monster, pedophile, what, groomer, whatever. Um, and there's something troubled by Sparrow injecting themselves um, and becoming both sort of victim and perpetrator at the same time that renders them completely illegible to the board, even while like talking and engaging, as you mentioned, with a medicalized thing and discourse that's very familiar. Um, that, yeah, that doesn't quite, like, fight the dehumanization that's going on, but instead tries to just upset it a bit by occupying both of those positions that I do think is, again, sort of unique to this sort of object choice that we're talking about around sexuality. But, but yeah, I'll, I'll just stick with that example. Thanks for that. Yeah. Jonathan? A bit inchoate as a question, but I'm struck by what seems to be a kind of haunting teleology that animates all three talks. Um, and this, uh, you know, this idea that somehow if we can get away from, I mean, even right identity transition, that there's a te teleology to these constructs, right? So if we can get away from this idea of progression of movement of move of, of moving towards something perhaps that's one way to achieve exactly what we're trying to but i'm as i'm listening to you i'm struggling to imagine and this is where the inchoateness comes in what that would look like how we could describe um a form of politics that is non-teleological mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, my whole book is trying to figure out what that, how to articulate that. And I think it varies so much in context. But I think um, I mentioned this only in passing in my in my talk. But um, yeah, there's a sort of um, refusal model that doesn't work in this context anymore. Um, you know, and I and I think that. Kim Awkward Rich has done so much work to show us what we disavow in, in you know, um, focusing on that teleology that you're talking about. Um, but also that I think that's very familiar to everyone engaging with transition, that they're disinterested in that. And so, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the exact language is. And that's par part of the reason that beyond some of the archives I'm looking at, there's so much film and literature and performance because I think it not only registers the constrictions of, of uh, uh, or restraints of, of that form, but tries to find another articulation and, and stillness that I was mentioning, because you, you brought up sort of resisting that kind of mobility is like most present actually in my Vietnam case study, which departs the most from this discourse of human rights and the right to gender identity. And um, in so much Vietnamese film, there's this, just like exhaustion with um, obsessive movement that was so big during the renovation period in film. And so, yeah, I think, I'm not sure what that is. In that, I'm calling it stillness, but I do think there is, yeah, across all of ours, a real desire to figure out a different articulation of what, of what, um, 
of, of something outside of, of the form you're talking about. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, Mary. no, 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 Mary. No, 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 we can talk. Talk. No, I don't know if I have anything uh, good to say. <laughs> Benji, talk. I'll, I'll say. I'll, I'll say one. I'll say one quick thing. Yeah. Um, I think you know my book is called Sexual Aim and It's Misses in part because you know if aim is is like you said totally haunted by this you know kind of Freudian telos of like you know that you know how to become a normal normal heterosexual boy. Um. Uh. That um, and you know, I think thinking with David's kind of question earlier, also about you know aim being so kind of circuitous and unruly, and thinking about like what is it that we, what is it that we're groping and grasping for when we have sex, um, but not just um, not just what we're reaching for when we when we kind of engage in physical acts, but like what kind of world can we kind of bring into being um through our kind of um our kind of attention to sort of wanting um and so i think that that kind of otherwiseness of of wanting that doesn't necessarily follow a kind of um a kind of clear track is, is sort of the, the politics that i want to kind of imagine if, if that makes sense and I'll just add like the one of the ways that I'm thinking about your question is just sort of at the field level, like how when in queer studies, like there's always this or I feel like there's often a desire to try to have queer do something like and that often it's this positivistic valence, right? Like to mm -hmm. to liberate, to open, to imagine futures and possibilities and other abstract things like that, right? And, you know, what if queerness one doesn't always do that? What if it's the opposite? But also what if sometimes like it's descriptive or just there, right? And so um yeah, and I remember, and I was at a presenting a, a, something once, and a kind of similar to what I was saying, like, what do we do with this like care and these totalizing contexts of like harm and and what do we do with like moments of pleasure? And and someone was like, well, why do you have to do something with it? And like that's something that has really sat with me and thinking, right? Like maybe it is just like, what does it mean to just acknowledge it and not make it do something? So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that's something that I'm thinking about. I have been told by gr higher authorities <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, our panel is over, but thank you so much for that fantastic discussion. <laughs>